today's National Soil Survey webinar. My name is Sean McVeigh, National Training Coordinator for the Soil Science Division and host for today's webinar, Land Change Monitoring, Assessment, and Projection. This webinar is being recorded and all participants join the webinar in listen-only mode. You receive the webinar audio through your device's speakers. There's no telephone dial-in. If you are having audio difficulties, please check the various ways your computer speakers may be muted or have their volume set low, including the speaker adjustments available in the Adobe Connect interface. You can maximize your webinar experience in Adobe Connect by shutting down VPNs and any other programs that might compete for bandwidth. This includes email and MS Outlook and instant messaging and link or now called Skype for Business. Please take a look at our webinar room layout. We have content pods that allow you to ask questions, provide comments, and of course view the webinar presentation. Please use the four arrow icon in the featured presentation pod that allows you to enter and exit the full screen view as you choose. To submit a comment or question for me or our presenter, use the Q&A pod and type in your question. We'll handle technical difficulties the best we can while hosting the webinar and interact with our presenter to answer your questions during verbal Q&A period. I want to thank Dave Hoover for being here to support our webinar and introduce our presenters. Dave, I'm going to turn the webinar over to you so you can introduce the topic and our presenter. Thank you, Sean. This is Dave Hoover. I'm the current director of the National Soil Survey Center. I want to welcome all the folks in the room here as well as in, in telephone land to our, uh, our webinar today. We're fortunate this week to have some visitors from the Aeros, USGS Aero Center in Sioux Falls, South Dakota with us. We have David Hare, Jeff Danielson, and Norman Bliss with us, and our, our presenter who will we'll be online here and be introduced in a minute. Uh, this is a time this week for us to talk with a fellow technical center. Uh, many of us have used their, uh, their data and their services for lots of years. Uh, and uh, their, their services have done nothing but, but increase their data holdings, their capabilities, and we just thought it was time for us to get together as, as two centers and talk about what, what's going on there, what's going on here, where we have some possible uh, collaborations, technical transfer, and information exchange. So uh, certainly welcome them uh, with us this week, and I'll turn it over now to uh, David Hare with USGS. All right. Thank you, Dave. Uh, very, thank you, Dave, for the invitation, and uh, Lisa, for um, uh, your offer to make this presentation. But let me just um, start with saying that um, one of the key um, strategic priorities for the Aero Center is this uh, land change monitoring assessment and projection, a uh, really new science foundation and trust as, as we move uh, forward. Uh, Elisa is uh, one of our um, key research scientists at the center. She is um, a principal investigator at our center for our, our vegetation, climate, uh, water, and climate dynamics. And she has been uh, really the, the, the leading scientist that has taken this concept and developed it into a set of, uh, of research steps and activities that enable us to move forward and to have communicated uh, what our what our goals are and um, and with our um, uh, sponsors from headquarters from a funding perspective. Uh, so with that, uh, Elisa, uh, you're the expert here. I will turn it over to you. Okay, thank you. Can you hear me all right? Sounds like a strong voice. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see if I get weaker as I go on or not. Uh, well, thank you for the opportunity to talk about this EROS initiative on land change monitoring, assessment, and projection, or as we refer to it, LC MAP. And to start, I want to give you a little bit of context for what this is about, or, or at least what our motivation is. We need to understand where the landscape has been where it is now and to understand that well enough so that we could project where it could go. Now we've been doing this for years to various degrees, but we've never been very efficient at it. So if you pose the land change question, it could take us years to come up with an answer. So as we march into the future, this whole LC map initiative is about a new way of looking at land change so that we could be much more efficient at answering questions about how the landscape is, is changing and in fact be so efficient that we could proactively alert relevant stakeholders 
to changes that are happening that are of interest to them. So it's about doing a much better job at supporting the user community. Now, one of the things we have at our center on which we base a lot of our land change uh, assessments is this archive from Landsat. And it's the longest running satellite series anywhere in the world, enabling us to go back to the early 1970s and look at how the landscape has changed. So LC Map isn't about only using Landsat imagery, but it's about making good use of that imagery that we have in a way that's much easier to access than it ever has been before. The traditional way to look at land change has been something like this, where you dive into our archive and you spend a lot of time sorting through uh, imagery to find cloud-free looks at your areas of interest. And you would do that for whatever the time periods are of interest. And you could go back to the early 70s with this Landsat series and say, well, how has the landscape changed? And you would do this for um, different time periods. You would assemble these snapshots. Essentially, this perspective lets you look at time one and time two and determine, has the landscape changed? Time two and time three, has it changed now? And so traditionally, this is what people have done. And it has taken us a lot of time to do that on a national scale. You spend an inordinate amount of time looking for cloud-free data. The larger your area of interest, the longer it takes to try to find a good time period where you could start assembling data across the large area without those pesky clouds in the way hiding the landscape. Once you finally uh, decide what data you want, then you put in a request. And whether you're inside our center or you're outside, you, you would have to download one image at a time. It takes a tremendous amount of time just to get your data. Then there are a bunch of early processing steps you need to um, probably reproject it into a different map projection. You have to correct for atmospheric interference. You might have to mosaic scenes together or fill in data gaps where there were some clouds or where you had um, drop out of pixels. All that stuff takes a long time. And traditionally, that has taken half or maybe 3 quarters of the time for many of our land, land cover products just to get the data together before you get to look at the change. Once you get the data together, then you're faced with the usual challenges in that land cover reflectance is really fairly ambiguous. The same land cover type in the same place on the ground could look vastly different if it rained yesterday or if this is a dry year and last year was wet. So that these kinds of changes in the conditions can make the land cover look more different than an actual change in the cover type itself. And therefore, when you only get a snapshot in time to look at land change, it can be hard to determine when there really hasn't been, when there has been change and when just the conditions are different enough to fool you into thinking there has been change. So if you wanted to take a decadal look across the country, then you would be looking for data like the, that upper image on the left that's cloud-free. And you'd be tossing away the image on the right that has the popcorn clouds and all their shadows. You wouldn't want to use that because you want a clear look across your area. And for every pixel, you might get to see something like this graph. Um, so these three points is just one pixel. And I'm just showing a graph of one part of the electromagnetic spectrum uh, although Landsat is collecting data in multiple parts of the spectrum. But I didn't want to make a messier graph than this one, so we're just going to look at one part right now. Has this pixel changed through time? Uh, I can see it's not identical each time, but it's hard to determine whether there's anything here to make me think it has really changed in, in terms of the land cover type represented. So let's say I got ambitious and I assembled data for every year for the growing season, except that there were some years where it was so cloudy across the whole scenes that, that I just I couldn't get a good image, like that one on the left up there, that clear scene. So even, even then, it could be hard for me to tell if this pixel has changed. Obviously, it doesn't have the same reflectance year in and year out. Sometimes it's stronger. Sometimes it's weaker. At what point? would I feel comfortable saying, well, it probably represents a change in the land cover. Well, there's a different way now 
to consider if reflectance has changed and represents a change on the ground. We can now drill down through the whole history of a pixel, go down through our whole archive, and say, if this pixel has a clear observation, I will use it. And I don't care if the rest of the scene is cloudy. If it's clear over my pixel, I'm taking that observation. And if you do this, you can develop these dense time series of the reflectance response for this pixel through time. And in fact, you can use then a mathematical function to describe the response of that pixel so that you know for certain when it has changed. And this whole approach was developed by colleagues of ours um, at Boston University under the direction of Curtis Woodcock. They are members of the Landsat Science team, and this is an international advisory team on Landsat Science, and it's supported by the USGS. So they developed this algorithm, this approach that makes good use of the full depth of the history that we have in the archive as a different way to tell when a pixel is representing change on the landscape, rather than the traditional snapshot approach, which can't do as good a job accommodating the vagaries of yesterday's rainfall or this year's dry conditions. So here's a couple examples. This is going to buy us some new products to consider from what we've been able to put out in the past. I not only can tell that there's been a change between the two snapshots at the top, the pre-fire and post-fire um, time periods, but now with this approach, I know the actual timing of that change. So I can do a much better job of reporting timing of change. The other thing that I can do for the first time is I can look at gradual forms of change. So not just the abrupt conversion, but the post-fire recovery in this example. We haven't had a good way to do that in the past, so it's largely been left undone. Here's another example. It's in a semi-arid landscape. We've traditionally struggled to tell when there's been land change in these landscapes because they tend to be brighter. That background substrate shows through the vegetation more because the vegetation is not super lush in these environments. And also, because of the, the limitations of water in that environment, you can have very similar kinds of vegetation growing in your crops, the hay field, um, disturbed periods of time. It can all be a mix of graminoid herbaceous kinds of species that don't look very different when you only have a snapshot. But when you can look at the temporal trajectory of their reflectance characteristics, it's much easier to tell that there has been change at different intervals through the history of the pixel. And even if you don't think that the mathematical trajectory does a great job at uh, describing the observations, such as that squiggly blue line on the left of the graph, you still can tell for sure when the trajectory changes, when the observations are not on that trajectory anymore. And you still get information about the slope of the observations. So this way of looking at the response of a given area through time is much richer in information than the traditional way of only having a snapshot now and then. So I've been showing you all these graphs of one pixel and one band or part of the electromagnetic spectrum, but this algorithm actually is happening across all of the bands that Landsat collects, and it's happening in all of the pixels. So your, your output is going to be a surface, not just one pixel at a time. So our products of the future now could represent things like, oh, shown in the middle here, where we're not just showing the footprints of change, but we're also showing the timing of those patches of change. In this example, the darker the blue, the further back in time, and the redder, the more recent, time of change for these patches. And then the graphic on the right that's circled, that's a land cover map. OK, you've seen them before. We've produced them before. But we've never been able to produce them for any desired day of year before. And now we can. We can stop the clock on any particular date. And instead of saying, what does my pixel look like on this date, we say, what kind of trajectory was it on on this date? So 
that enables us to generate a map for any date, which is great because now you can sync up your, your thematic map product with other kinds of data, like maybe your validation data or maybe uh, data you have from another sensor. So this gives us a lot more flexibility in the outputs that could be generated from this approach. And of course, I mentioned that we have this capability now to look at gradual change. So for the first time, we could consider products that, that are trying to characterize whether the landscape is greening or getting less green and where it's happening. And then people can start researching why it's happening. So the whole business with LC Map then is to try to refocus and integrate Eros's capabilities to do this kind of monitoring everywhere. Well, it takes a little more to do the monitoring than just having a good algorithm. And I've just been talking about that circled part of the system, the good algorithm. Uh, but in fact, this is going to take a larger integrated effort. So you have to be able to feed the algorithm. You can't feed this algorithm if you're downloading scenes one at a time and doing all those prep steps um, that the individual had to do in the past. That means we have to invest in providing data that are analysis ready that you can just keep pushing into your algorithm every time you get a new overpass. And this is something that we have been working on here at Eros. In fact, the, the formal definition of analysis ready data is being reviewed this week as we sit here by the Landsat Science team. So we will be now having a new product that's analysis ready data that we will use internally but also make available to the user community. And that's how we will feed this monitoring capability to continuously be looking at what's going on in the landscape. And from there, of course, we'll be flagging and characterizing forms of change. And we'll be producing assessments. Um, we've done that in the past, but we've never produced them cyclically. We never had some kind of annual report on change because we didn't have the capacity to turn out that information with the frequency you need. Uh, we'll have to have a way of storing information forms that we've never stored before. We never had to store pixel histories, but we'll need to do that now. Uh, we've never made it easy for someone to come in and get information about the algorithms and the individual um, histories of what's been going on in the landscape. You always had to get one of our products, or you had to get our data and generate your own product. So we'll have an information warehouse that will contain um, the traditional forms of, of information you've come here for in the past, but we'll also have these new forms. And we have to make it easier for people to come in and get this information. If you have downloaded any Landsat scenes lately, you know that, that you have to have a lot of space on your system to accommodate just one overpass and all the bands you get with Landsat now. But if we're talking about a dense time series, then you could be trying to download anywhere from a, a half to a full terabyte of information. And then what are you going to do with that? So we have to generate a better way, an interface, that will allow the user community to come in, interact with the data, do queries, and get the information they want without having to drag all the data over the internet and try to generate it on their local system. So that means that this whole system, this integrated system that would support the LC Map initiative has some new characteristics from the user standpoint. Instead of you doing all the data prep, the data prep can be done for you. Instead of us trying to find whole clear images that we can use to look for landscape change, we will be drilling down at the pixel level to find clear observations, which enables us to have a much denser time series to look at. We'll be implementing this in an automated and continuous monitoring fashion. Uh, it will allow us to look not only for abrupt land cover conversions, but gradual forms of change. It will give us this efficiency to provide annual reports and to, to provide some more proactive stakeholder alerts. We'll be storing more forms of information than we have in the past. And we'll be developing ways to make it easier for you and the other users in the community to come in and get that information. So all this is going to have to happen in an environment 
where we have quality assurance built into it because you want to know something about how reliable the data or the information or the algorithm is that you're coming in to, um, to grab from us. So all the steps and components that we're building, we're doing this with a QA mindset. Um, there are folks here who could tell you more about where we are in terms of building the system that supports LCMAP, but on the science side, which is where I'm more familiar, I can tell you that we have selected a bunch of test areas across the U.S. We're using these as areas with different kinds of land cover challenges that we can throw at the algorithm to see how well it performs in these different environments. And then looking at the output, it will tell us whether we need to do any tweaking or refining of the algorithm. So this is some testing that we're doing underway. I have circled uh, one of the test areas up there in the Puget Sound area just to show you a little bit of output from this algorithm. So we'll be looking over this extent that's outlined in the square. And here would be traditional kinds of output. We generated annual maps from 1985 through 2014 using this algorithm. I'm just showing you the start and end points. So you could probably detect, well, there's a little bit more red spread over the map in 2014, and, and that represents development or urban expansion. You might determine that there's a little more yellow out there on the east side, and that's grassland that usually has come in to replace forest, either from forest harvest or from wildfire. Um, but all in all, this landscape doesn't look tremendously different, just a bit different. However, if we took the capacity of the algorithm to monitor change through time on a regular basis and we view the cumulative change in this area, it's, it's a lot more recognizable that this is quite a dynamic area after all. And the color scheme we're using here gives an idea of when the change occurred. So earlier changes are shown in blue and more recent changes in red. And this tells us that we might not have appreciated how much change is actually happening in the landscape if we took our traditional snapshot approach. Now I'm going to zoom in. I just arbitrarily picked an area in the sound there to zoom in because you want to know, does, does it end up looking like scattershot pixels of change when you've got an algorithm that drills down through an individual pixel and doesn't pay attention to its neighbors? Well, in fact, its neighbors are behaving similarly in their dense time series because we end up with these shapes that are recognizable when we look at higher resolution imagery, in this case from Google Earth. So it's, it's kind of heartwarming that the results end up making some intuitive sense based on other images that you can look at. And I like the fact that in the center where there's the, the very fine, the, the little patches that this low density urban expansion is showing up and the timing of it is being captured because we have struggled traditionally to do a good job representing low density urban development in our traditional methods. So at first blush, things are looking quite well as we look at all our test areas with this algorithm and we are starting to think about how do we how do we automate this so that it's continuously monitoring and we continuously can update our products over time. So this is a nutshell view of the LCMAP initiative. And it's ultimately it's this capability to continuously track and characterize changes over time so that we can translate the information into assessments that support evaluations and decisions that are relevant for environmental management and policy. And we'll be rolling out different components of LCMAP through time over the next several years so that people can start realizing the benefits. And I plan to stop at this point so that there would be plenty of time for discussion since Norman alerted me that that would be a good thing to do. So be willing to take questions. All right. Uh, Dave Hoover would like to make a few comments first. Well, first of all, I, I just think it's, it's great to hear somebody describe data analysis as heartwarming. 
because I think I think all of us who have who have put a lot of time in the development of our data set feel the same way. So thank you very much, Delisa, for that. Uh, I was going to mention to folks that whereas we want to concentrate initial questions on this presentation, we will leave the phone lines open and this room open for a while longer after that in order to have a greater discussion. If anybody has any other questions about uh, about Arrow's data or services uh, plans about your own projects. Uh, uh, anyway, we'll, we'll, keep, we'll keep going here for, for a while longer after we conclude with questions uh, about this specific uh, LC map presentation. So I'll turn it back to Sean. All right, well, I'll just remind everyone that's online that the way you ask a question is to put it in the Q&A pod, and uh, we'll be able to address those questions as they come in. And while we wait for the people online to enter their questions, are there any questions from the room? Lincoln. Well, Lisa, we do have one question online we'll start with, and it is, could these changes help with soil organic carbon estimates given improved land cover monitoring? Well, ostensibly they could, so I'm, I'm not a carbon person. I'm, well, I am, actually. I'm made up of carbon, but I mean, I'm not a carbon <laughs> specialist. <laughs> I'm not a carbon specialist, but I, I would imagine that these would have to help because if we are doing a better job than ever of tracking what's going on above ground, that certainly has to relate to what there's available for below ground. And, and so I, I would have to think that that this should only improve the information that would go into making those estimates. And a follow-up to that, and placed in sync with climate modeling too? Yeah, you know, I think for the first time when we take a dense time series look at Landsat this way, we finally have information at a scale that allows us to look at climate change. Because in the past, when you just went with every overpass, 16-day overpass, and then you threw out the cloudy one, so you, it was kind of hit or miss how many images you could have in a year. That didn't really align very well with um, climate data, like trying to use daily weather station data and building that into seasonal looks at, at what was happening and then interannual looks. I think this time scale has given us a chance, finally, to do much better job with analyzing Landsat information in sync with, with um, climate change. And in fact, the, the dynamics group that Dave said that we have here at Eros looking at vegetation, water, and climate dynamics, we plan to do just that. And I've seen already some output where we're starting to look at can we detect the difference between um, wetter years and drier years if we have some kind of climate trend in some area. And I've seen some output that indicates we're going to be able to do that, but it's still early days. But I, I'm really encouraged. I think we finally got a time scale that will help synchronize with climate data. Elisa, well, another question. Uh, can pasture land be singled out from cropland? I sure hope so. Um, the reason I think we might be able to do it this way is because they are managed differently. And so if there is a temporal signal, we should be able to, to separate those two. Another question, are these Landsat algorithms going to translate to other remotely sensed products like SPOT? Um, I already know that folks uh, so the developers, the group from Boston University, they're already applying this algorithm to MODIS data. So I know that it can be used with other sensor data. And they haven't applied it to SPOT, but it could be used with SPOT. There's no reason it couldn't. There's a question about how big are the computer used for the LC map? Are they supercomputers or what? <laughs> oh, this is like the $64,000 question right at the moment at Eros. Um, so we are currently running these algorithms at Boston University because they've got this humongous setup with all these hundreds of processors. 
and they developed it there, and so they've been using it there. And we didn't have a setup like that at Eros because all of our processors are sort of, sort of partitioned into smaller groupings and owned by different projects. So the first order of business was to rewrite the original code for this algorithm from the language it was written in, which is proprietary, to something that's open source. And then the second step is to make it more efficient, which is underway right now, and then use the more efficient version to figure out what kind of setup do we need at Eros, how large does it need to be, because uh, we're getting some information to indicate that it could be not, it could be done on a system that is much smaller than the one it's being done on right now at Boston University. Got sort of a multi-part question for you. So first part is, what is the initial rollout date? And how far back will the time series go? And how will the data from the different Landsat platforms be integrated? OK, let's hope I remember all of these. OK, so right now we can pretty well integrate information from Landsat 4 through 8, uh, because they all have similar kind of sensor type. And our initial rollout is to use, the, the plan for the initial rollout is to use the Landsat 4 thematic mapper sensor data forward. And so that will allow us to go back to um, the early half of the 80s. To, to use that forward and to produce a data set of analysis-ready data across the U.S. and to produce output from this algorithm across the U.S. by uh, November of 2017 or fall of 2017. That will be our initial rollout. And then beyond that, we plan to um, go work further to get um, the MSS sensor, the earlier Landsat sensor, to figure out how we can incorporate that into these time series. And then we also plan to expand beyond the US. So the initial rollout will be by fall of 2017. And then beyond that is to go back further in time and to expand further in space. Did I hit all the questions in that? I believe so. Elisa, okay. Can I, this is Dave. Um, one thing that um, you might touch on, too, is uh, the European uh, uh, space. Uh, oh, the Sentinel? Sentinel-2, yeah. Yeah, um, so one of the things that we're doing in our analysis-ready data component is instead of using the path row, which is how your data would come now, we're actually tiling the data. And with the tiling scheme, you get an advantage of if you have adjacent side-by-side -side path rows. They always have some overlap. With our tiling scheme, you get all of the overlaps that occur in that tile, which means you get a greater data density. And what we've been seeing so far is that it is virtually is doubling the amount of data you have for pixels that are in that overlap area. Well, with the, uh, the new Sentinel-2 system that, that Europe has sent up, that system has a higher frequency overpass, and it has data being collected comparable in the bands that Landsat's collecting. So we're planning to test when those data become available, can we use those to enrich our Landsat record and essentially get that even richer database that, or data series that we're seeing right now in just the overlap areas where Landsat overlaps itself. And if we, if we can get that, then we would start being able to detect changes that are even more ephemeral, like floods or um, some of the, the fires in grasslands that don't stick around too long before the grass grows back. We would be able to see more ephemeral kinds of change if we had the density that would come from being able to merge the Sentinel-2 data with our Landsat data. Elisa, could this also help with the NAS crop data layer work? I hope so, because um, you know there's a lot of crop types out there, and NAS, I believe, traditionally focus a lot of their effort on getting a handful of those crops really right, and then the rest of them, you know, come what may. And I think 
anytime you have a denser data series, temporal series, about a kind of cover type that inherently has temporal processes that distinguish it from, from other cover types, I would think that it has to improve their ability to, to distinguish additional crops at higher levels of accuracy than they're able to do right now. All right, a uh, question with a little bit of setup with it. Uh, if you have a known polygon with a known land use such as grassland today, could this dense pixel analysis detect short-term change that might have occurred since or even before 1970? For example, would it detect an area within the grassland that was farmed for a period of time? Well, that's a, that's a good question. Um, so I don't know. I mean, the short answer, of course, is I don't know. But I'm going to give you a little bit longer answer. There's a person here at my center, Bruce Wiley, who has been using time series, not with Landsat data, but with MODIS sensor data, usually. Um, but he's assembled dense time series, and he's looked at behaviors of things over time. And he's found some legacy patterns in places that used to be uh, feedlots because of all that extra uh, fertilization that went on. He's found areas that were so much greener that shouldn't have been greener based on the other area um, other surrounding area and what the weather was doing over all the years. And so there could be some legacies from some of the um, earlier land treatments and management prior to 70s that you could see. But in order to understand what they were, you would, of course, have to dive into whatever kind of historical information you could find. All right. Well, there's a comment here. Thanks. This is very exciting news. We're excited. Any other questions? Oh, since I'm in the room, I get to talk, I guess. Um, I was just wondering if there are differences in the sensitivity between areas and land use cover types. You know, can you detect change more easily, say, in a, the crop areas, cropped areas versus shrubland that may have less dramatic changes? Well, undoubtedly, there, there are different sensitivities. And some of the systems, uh, some of the landscapes are more flashy in their response than others to whatever is happening in the weather, for example. Uh, so some of these systems have um, longer memory, and it takes longer. There's more of a lag time for them to respond to a change in conditions. And so there will be a relation between the regional environments and the land cover and the land management and what the climate's doing or what the weather's doing. There will be relations that you can probably anticipate in terms of the sensitivity We've been looking at the output from those different path rows that I showed you. And before you look at the output in mind, you always say, well, I think I'm going to start seeing such and such in this landscape because I know it's got these environmental conditions and I know it's been treated this way. And invariably, when you see the signals, you'll look at, at the mathematical model and you'll look at all the observations around it, and it fits what you expect a lot of the time. So yes, there are differences in sensitivities. Um, this algorithm seems to deal with it pretty well because it's basing its model on any given pixel's um, response over time. And it's looking, if that pixel responds differently than it used to in the past, you'll pick it up, even though its response may be damped down compared to some other pixel that's much further away. Are your algorithms, I mean, this just in general, are they, is there a geographic component to them, or is it purely spectral? So far, it's purely spectral. And we are discussing whether to bring in a geographic component in the future. Right now, we can't consider it because we have to figure out how to make it more efficient to run. If we were to bring in a spatial component right now, it would, it would just drag the whole thing down. So, when we become more efficient at running it here, when the people who are programmers turn it into a more efficient 
program, then we can start considering how to make good use of the spatial information. Hey Lisa, this is Dave again. There have Boston has done some comparative analysis and cor correct me or add of what kind of factors or parameters to consider in the algorithm. Uh, uh, is that right? No, actually, we've done those. Okay, that's, um, that's yeah. And the reason you so the I should mention that the lead developer from Boston is now doing a postdoc at Eros, so we're getting the benefit of that, but. He's done that work when he's been at Eros. So, so in a way, both both of us are right. Uh, but <laughs> yes, uh, he has looked at the uh, some ancillary data to bring into it to see how we can improve the labeling of the land cover change. Um, the algorithm kind of has uh, two parts. The first part, where it just simply mathematically goes through, characterizes what's going on, and flags change, and it's the the latter part where you actually put a label on it if you're trying to make a land cover map. And so it's the latter part where we've brought in some ancillary data that he has tested to see what kinds of variables can help improve um, our ability to develop a thematic map. But so far, we haven't taken advantage of the spatial information and what are my neighborhood pixels doing and can they contribute to me putting a label on the map. That's something that's on our our interest list, but it's not reached a point where it's logistically feasible yet. Another comment is uh, pasture that's fertilized with feedlot animal waste versus pasture without applied feedlot waste should have a much different color. This would be helpful in determining pasture land receiving feedlot waste versus just grazing animal waste. Uh, this would be very helpful information. Yeah, this sounds like an application that that could be tested as soon as we're able to put out um, additional data or if any of the areas um, that we're already working in are places where you would have that kind of information, you're welcome to look at our um, our test output and see whether there are differences like that. I will mention that I, I have a, an application we haven't started to do the work yet, but I have one that in um, partnership with the CRP folks, they would like to tell or find out if we can tell the difference between good CRP land, good managed land, and not as good managed land because there should be a difference in the greenest signature. So I think we have some output that could be fodder for looking at some of these things for anyone who has an application in an area that we've already produced output. One of the things I was thinking about is from a compliance perspective, you know, if you're looking at, you know, mowing before a certain date or uh, incremental filling of wetlands or anything like that. Yeah, I don't know if, I probably don't have the sensitivity for mowing Although maybe when Sentinel is brought in, since that would have a, a much higher frequency overpass return. Um, but I would think an incremental filling with the wetlands, as long as we're talking about wetlands that are larger than the resolving capacity of the pixel size of Landsat, uh, that you should be able to see that. We have looked at some of the prairie pothole wetlands to see whether that periodicity shows with the um, the drought deluge cycles, and it does. So I would have to think that incremental filling is certainly going to have a different signal through time. Another question online, how are the pixels organized across the globe, just by latitude and longitude? Um, right now, the testing has gone on in the, the form, the native form that you get it when you download data is right now UTM, so UTM meters. and uh, when we start making analysis-ready data, we're going to be developing everything using the, the, um, the typical ALBERS parameters that USGS uses for the products like the National Land Cover Data Set. Uh, so right now it's in the native UTM that you get from doing a requisition from our archive, but in the future it will be ALBERS for the U.S. And I'm not sure what the decisions are going to be on how best to do it for other countries. 
Here's another one that's got a, a bit of a setup to it. Um, thanks. It would appear that if grassy areas were plowed or cropped for a three to five or ten year period and then reverted back to grassy cover, the time periods that the ground was actually tilled or black would possibly show as outliers in the graphical pixel data. Another way to put it, within that polygon would the periods of tillage or the black be significantly different than periods of vegetative cover? It makes sense that they should be. And uh, we'll know for sure, I guess, if when someone decides to take a look. But it should be. I mean, those things, if you caught them right at, at the, the perfect time, even with the snapshot approach, you would see those differences. So if you're trying to monitor through time, uh, as long as they stayed in those different states for long enough, then we should be able to capture them. Now, right now, the way the algorithm is tuned, it doesn't flag a change unless the pixel, um, the reflectance starts acting out of range of the trajectory it's been following. It needs to act differently than expected for five overpasses five consecutive overpasses, however long it takes to get those overpasses. So that means right now it could be um, anywhere from a little over a month to two or three months, depending on if you're having a terribly cloudy period or whatever. Um, but when we have higher frequency data, like in those side lap areas right now, or when we bring in sentinel data, you would be able to detect the change uh, much sooner because it would take a lot less time to get five consecutive observations that signified a change. So you ought to be able to pick up anything that is spectrally different as long as it lasts that long. Well, Lisa, there's just been multiple positive comments about the web webinar. I want to thank you for your time and effort to make this presentation today. And thanks to all the participants for joining in. We had more than 100 people join today's webinar. And the on-demand recording for this webinar will be available on our center's YouTube channel within a few days. So feel free to let your colleagues know about this training opportunity. And this is going to conclude our webinar presentation.